Albert Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Like being spun around on the tire swing and feeling surprised when you puke on the kid who insisted on pushing you. Insanity was somewhat fun when I was little. My brother and I used to sit at the top of the stairs in our first house and face each other saying the same thing at the same time. We said the same thing, we'd say in unison, at the same time. We'd scream and laugh, saying it over and over, trying to catch each other's cadence and match it perfectly. I recognized the nature of infinity and reveled in it while I sat on the bathroom counter and positioned the folding vanity mirrors open so I could see the reflection of my face double and triple on and on. My reflection went on forever, and I thought I did too. In my mind, infinity looked like the braids my mom would twist into my hair, one strand over the other until we reached the ends of my hair. My hair would grow, and so would my braid, and in the mirror, the braid would go on forever. The nature of infinity was easy early on. I learned in school that eternity was as simple as learning God, and that if I did this as long as I could, I would last as long as God. Repetition was fun, like laughing with my brother or listening to the same song over and over again. In the mirror, I had multiple sets of eyes, an outlasting amount of mouths full of teeth to eat as much as I wanted, to laugh as long as I wanted. But no one taught me about the price of eternity until a year or two later when I was in kindergarten at a Christian elementary school. Our teacher told us about heaven. At that time, heaven was prescribed as the most desirable thing any braided girl could want. I thought it was boring and said so out loud and was sent outside for a time out. <laughs> outside the classroom, I thought about heaven as a vacation destination, the end point at the end of a long line of life. My teacher described it to us with a felt board. She stuck on a length of road, the streets of gold, boring, and added some angels singing, so boring, and told, all, and told us all of our friends would be there. Later in the same school district, my seventh grade teacher taunted us by saying, if you don't watch it, you could be the trash collector in heaven. <laughs> I didn't know there were assigned jobs, and did we have to fill out applications for these jobs? Was heaven a socialist realm? Were there labor unions? Could I quit? <laughs> Back in kindergarten, when I matched up the idea of infinity with heaven, I realized that I'd be stuck there for a long time. My multiple mouths would be stuck playing trumpet on loop. My eyes would get sick of staring at all that gold and blur forever. No way. I thought, heaven sounds lame. <laughs> Later, when I grew older and things became more complicated, I learned that, yes, humans do go on forever, but you could only get to eternity through Jesus. By the time junior high rolled around, metaphors for redemption were introduced, including the bridge of salvation. This was a four-step plan. The image was simple enough. There were two mountains separated by a great divide. One mountain you were already on, I'd imagine this mountain was called life, and the other was the mountain you wanted to get to. That's where the party was at. This was eternity with God. In other words, heaven. At this point, heaven was depicted as this awesome party full of awesome people and angels. And if you weren't there, you were missing out. This was the motivation and the thing you wanted in junior high, to be invited to the party. <laughs> the divide below was symbolized as sin. This separated you from the party that Jesus was throwing at the figurative Salvation Mountain. The only way across was, of course, by a bridge in the shape of a cross, and the cross was symbolized as symbolized Jesus dying for your sins. Can you see how this was confusing? I wish the metaphors were physical. I remember my brother saying to me at the top of the stairs we took to the parking lot when my mom picked us up after school. I want to cross the bridge, but literally, I don't know how. In this way, the bridge metaphor became the stabbing pain that comes with ambiguity. We got immobilized on that bridge, paralyzed with fear, the wind blowing and shaking the ramparts. Were there handrails on this bridge? Could you back out? It was like kids climbing up the slide on the playground or the high diving board at the community pool. It looked like fun, but once I got up there, I did not want to jump. Take a leap of faith, posters in our classrooms would say. But neither of us knew how to, and infinity wasn't fun anymore. Infinity then became one small moment on loop, like being scared at the top of the ladder to the slide and not being able to move in either direction. Infinity could be awful, like having the same conversation over and over with the boy you liked but not getting anywhere. But every now and then, infinity was beautiful. It was being lost in a song, pushing the repeat button on my car stereo and soaking in that guitar solo one more time. David Byrne the Talking Heads taught me that heaven was a place where nothing ever happened, and I knew it now walking over real sidewalks in real time with my iPod, that I could be stuck in a moment that I liked, and maybe that could be heaven. A good heaven, without banal angels or chintzy gold, 
a heaven with good music, good drinks, where everyone was hanging out and sharing the jukebox. Still, I was trying to get to Jesus. Jesus was the personification of the bridge, and maybe if I focused on him instead of the damn bridge metaphor, I'd distract myself long enough to get across and into his perfect arms. By this time, I was in high school, and I was demoralized by religion. Bored with the rhetoric and anxious, I read everything I could about Jesus. I had learned that if he drawn you to God, he would draw near to you. And knowing that Jesus was God's PR man, I tried to reduce my physical proximity as best I could. Of course, I didn't realize that Jesus was no longer physical, and these metaphors were figurative from the beginning. But I was confused, and I was desperate, and I was 17. Senior year, someone gave me a copy of Annie Lamott's Traveling Mercies, and I read about how she would crumple up a Kleenex tissue in her fist and imagine she was holding Jesus' hand. In her memoir, she was trying to overcome addiction while being a single mother. I was just trying to get through high school, and somehow, in my dramatic way, I thought the two were congruent. So I tried something similar. I pretended Jesus was driving around in my passenger seat with my old Volvo. Sorry, Jesus, I'd say while I cut someone off. Hope you like Bob Dylan, Jesus, I'd say out loud to no one but my brother, who sat in the back seat because I didn't want him to sit on Jesus. <laughs> when I pulled into the parking lot of the liquor store so I could buy my not yet 18 years old best friend smokes, I'd hold my breath and debate whether I should apologize to the Lord or pass him my cigarette. Jesus really was my homeboy, but since he never talked back, I didn't know what he approved of. The metaphors multiplied the longer I learned about God and the older I got. One of the more classic arguments concerned the nature of wind. It echoed in a DC talk song, a Christian band that sang about virginity and evangelism. You can't see the wind, the voice echoed in the song, but you can feel the effects of the wind. That made enough sense. The wind blows and the trees move. That was physical and you could understand it. Since you could see the trees moving in the wind, you knew the wind was real. This was the type of agreement re reality I was working with, but could barely fit into my quest for infinity. In my dumb, young mind, I wondered if God was the wind. That's it, I said, turning to invisible Jesus in my car. The wind. The answer really was blowing in the wind. So maybe like Jesus liked Bob Dylan after all. However, the problem of the bridge metaphor still prevailed. I knew I was stuck on that stupid bridge, and I was beginning to resign myself to just staying there. According to the images, the divide of sin was deep, and the bridge was in the shape of the cross. Maybe I had moved far enough to get to the point where the wood crossed itself, jutting outwards into short pieces where Jesus' hands were nailed. That was confusing, too. Was he letting us borrow the bridge for the metaphor? How long does the cross last? What kind of wood was it? How old is the bridge, and how long will it hold up as long as I'm standing here? While the proverbial winds blew up on the bridge, my metaphorical braids unraveled. Now my hair was a mess, tangled and flying in my face, making the crossover that much more difficult. In my mind, I tied my hair back up in a braid, having moments of clarity where I felt I understood it all at last. With courage, I'd stand up to walk, only to make it a few inches before my hair unwound itself again. This was my constant metaphor, my song on loop. The insipid failure of not understanding the depths of God, the depths of sin, and the depths of the powerful fear that accompanied life. This was my obsession, my infinity where my hair and loss went on forever. I finally got so tired of trying that I forgot about the bridge and that I was even on it and made a home out of resignation. Sometimes I'd sneak glasses of people, glances of people on the other side, having a party of easy faith, having made it over to the Salvation Mountain without any hesitation. But by then, I didn't miss anything. I was content with not knowing. Here I was, stuck in the middle with Jesus in my car, driving around, trying to be kind to strangers, trying to make peace with things I didn't understand. I eventually let my brother sit in the front seat and pick the songs, and we played the same ones over and over, enjoying infinity on loop, in heaven, where nothing ever happens. Thank you. Angela Dyer, ladies and gentlemen.